that something that um, I think is very important for you all to know. It, it, it's brought in the Talmud, but it's very important to understand this. And it's, I think it's relevant for everyone. So I really have to share this with you. This time of year, everyone talks about the holiday season, right? I mean, you know, we have Jews of Hanukkah and the Christians have their holiday, and then they had a Kwanzaa, I don't know, different, different holidays, and everyone seems to have this period called the holiday time, and the world just mushes it all into one kind of thing, and we want to be nice, and we want to be politically correct, so we say, you know, happy holiday. But I got to explain to you the root of why so many people have their holidays right now. This is not a new thing. This is the most ancient time of holidays ever. Let me explain this to you. When Adam and Eve first sinned, it says that what happened was God told them there would be death. It would bring death into the world. And what happened was they didn't know what that would look like. So what happened was the creation of the world and Adam is Rosh Hashanah, which is the fall time. Right? It's the fall, September, around so in, in the Torah, in, in, in the, the lunar calendar, it's called Tishrei, first day of Tishrei. Adam and Eve saw that the days were getting shorter and shorter. And it says that Adam then got nervous and he said, This is maybe the death that is supposed to happen. And it says that. What happened was what, the days were getting shorter. The eight days before what's called Tukufas Tevet, the shortest day of the year, Adam began an eight days of fasting, praying that he wouldn't die because he thought the punishment of even the truth of good and evil is going to go into land, to darkness. And if there's no sun and persons in darkness, they will not live very long. He thought that was happening. And it said what happened was he fasted for eight days. Then he saw that the days started getting longer. And he saw it, since they were getting longer slowly, he realized that this wasn't the death that he was going to experience. Rather, this was the cycle of the world. And it says he made a festival for eight days afterwards. Now, this is so important to understand. The Talmud says Adam, when he first did it, the next, the next year, he made the eight days before the, the winter solstice, he made that into now a holiday, the year before he was fasting. And the eight days, yeah, he made it into a holiday. He made that holiday to be thanking God. And the Talmud says that what happened was later on, the idolaters took this time and turned it into idolatrous holidays. And then it became obsolete from the practices of the righteous. Now, what are some of these holidays? Well, these were Roman holidays. One was called Kalanda, and one was Saturnalia. Saturnalia was, was the 25th of December. It was the seven days, and the 25th of December was the major holiday. Now, these period of times, were ancient Roman holidays. This is not what I'm telling you is, is basic history. You could look it up. You know, Saturnalia, um, it's called Saturnura, and Kalanda, it was holidays before and after winter solstice. And that is some of what the Talmud is talking about when it says idolaters took that time and made it into holidays. And therefore the righteous desist from that. I, you have to understand this because, I, again, I don't, I, my, my objective here is not to, I don't want to, I'm not looking to, to insult anyone, to hurt anyone, but, but there's a problem when truth becomes muddled, it becomes something else. I, I'm not a Christian scholar, but those who know, if you look at actually the earliest Catholic um, documentation of when was JC's birthday, it was not the 25th of December, it's a well-known fact. The earliest Catholic uh, uh, recordings was March 18th. Then there was another opinion that was, I forgot the other, another date. The, the taking of the 25th of December 
was to incorporate the Roman pagans and to bring them into the fold. This is a known thing. I mean, this is, you can go look this up. So, I mean, again, you have to find the right, the right, the right websites for it. But that was done. As a matter, I don't know if you realize this, but the Puritans in America, when they first came, they would in, they, they would imprison somebody who celebrated the 25th of December because they said that was not really the root of it. That was taken from the holiday of the Romans of Saturnalia. Saturnalia was a was a holiday, it was a pagan holiday. They used to, they used to it actually in the Roman world, it's incredible. Eight days there were no courts. You know why? because there was no judgment, it was a free-for-all. People could rape, people could kill, and there would not be a judgment against them. They used to go around from door to door, naked, singing, drunken. That was the holiday of Saturnalia, which was a Roman pagan holiday. Now, why do I tell you all this? Because it, it's very important to understand like this. When you take truth, if you start to play with truth a little bit, you, with all your good intentions, you end up in a place that's really not good. The root of, of the holidays that people took was a place of what Adam and Eve did originally, thanking God. And then it turned into a pagan thing. And then other cultures took it and everyone had this holiday around that. Now, it happened to be that years later, God performed the miracle of Hanukkah for the Jewish people on this time of year, the time, the darkest time of year. And that's why the Jewish custom, it's really not, it's not very, it's not very uh, uh, elaborate. It's to light a candle. Lighting a candle means when, when it's the darkest time of year, you really need to see the light that's there. When this becomes corrupted in any way, we're gonna be in trouble. I, you know, I, 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 I watched a couple of days ago and, I, and this is gonna get a little bit political and I, and I, don't, I don't mean to be, but, but it's important to understand this. I, I saw Zelensky speaking at, the, um, at Congress and he walked out and they were all like, like he was like some kind of savior or something like that. I, I can't tell you if he's good or big. I, I don't know. I could tell you one thing. He is a Jewish person who's very confused, who does not know what Judaism is. And therefore, whatever he's trying to create, when you paint something as these are good and this is bad, and you painted something that's not correct, we're going to get burnt there. The light has to be a pure light. That's even why in Hanukkah, what happened was when the Greeks, the Greeks, and, and this is the most amazing thing about the, the story of Hanukkah, the Greek people were civilization. The modern civilization, people were barbarians before the Greeks. And the story of Hanukkah is the Jews against the Greeks. What do you mean? The, the Greeks really were the ones who were trying to make the world into a place that was that had culture, had something. And it's true. It's true. People before were barbarians. That's why the world, besides the Jews, embraced Greek philosophy because it was, it was, it, it had depth to it. The Greek philosophy in Jewish terms is hinted at in the beginning of the story of Genesis. It says there was tohu, there was darkness, there was, there was emptiness, bohu, vacantness, darkness on the face of the deep depth. And the sages tell us this was talking about the four exiles, the Babylonian exile, emptiness, and the Persian exile. And then the Greek exile was called the darkness. Why was it called darkness? It was seen to be light. It was the first light that people had to use their brains. And the answer is because when they, when they twisted something, they took truth and twisted it, it's never going to come out okay. And so for the Greeks, even though there was a big step up in the world, 
Later on, that was going to come out with very, very negative things. And that's why the sages fought them. In the story of Hanukkah, in the end, the rabbis want to light the menorah. Lighting the menorah was in, in the temple. We had the candelabra that we lit. The candelabra, understand, it wasn't, it wasn't that it was light for I mean, light. It represented God giving light out to the entire world. And what happened was the Greeks made a decree. They were fighting the Jews because they sensed the Jewish belief of, of bringing God in the world was very counter to their idea of humanism, their idea of human beings understanding as the center and making truth theirs. And you just have to understand this. The Greeks did not perform experiments, right? I didn't realize this. The Greeks were not scientists of today. Uh, Aristotle said, I sit in my chair and I think, and if I figure it out and it's logical, then it's true. If not, not. Which we know is not true today because relativity, quantum physics, so much of the, um, the things we're understanding in the world today do not make sense. They happen to be, we can show them in scientific experiments, but they're not that you understood it, therefore you're the sum total of it, which is what Aristotle and the Greeks believed. That's why their gods were in the forms of human beings. Why? Because their idea was, was the human intellect was the most important. We say human intellect is so important, but it has to be subservient to the actual truth. When I light a candle, I have a candle and I have the oil and I have the wick. It's like having a body that has a light from above, okay? The light has to come from above. If you, if we think that we have the answer and we know and we don't allow God to give us the endless light to give us the truth, we got nothing. And that's why it's, it's a made up. I always find it fascinating. Like every time you get like, you know, every year they come out, you know, I don't know, like, like, like when I was, when I was a young parent, like the book that you had to read was, you had to have, you know, Dr. Spock was the, you know, that was the, what the main book to raise your kid. Today, I think they, they arrest you. They get social services to come and say, oh, that Dr. Spock, that's, that's terrible. How come every single idea that everyone comes up with 20 years later, is like the, considered the stupidest idea in the world because they're all going by their head, their mind, and what they think is true in their time. And it may be a good idea, it may not be a good idea. And then 20 years later, someone else thinks they understand better. The truth has to come from a pure place. And that's why when the sages, the Greeks, they, they shut the temple down. They, they, they broke the temple. They made decrees that Jews could not serve God because the idea that Jew has to do is to bring God into the world. And that's what everyone here as a Noahide also has to do. You have to say, listen, I don't want to get caught up in changing the rules and making my own religion and making my own thing. What does God say? And how do I bring that into the world? And that's why when the Greeks stopped the Jews from using the temple, when they finally won, and they had found oil, but they wouldn't light the oil, only oil that was totally pure, that had the stamp of the high priest of Israel, that and was not touched by the Greeks. Why were they so, I mean, they needed to light oil. It took eight days for them to go and to get the oil from where they would draw the special oil from. Why not light the other oil? They had no choice. The answer is because they realized that once you play around with truth, you're finished. In Hebrew, the word truth is the word emet, emet, the most amazing word in the world. I mean, I, I can spend, you know, with you guys thousands of years on just the Hebrew alphabet. You will never believe the thing. But the word emet, it starts in the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter, and the last letter. Truth needs to be beginning, middle, and end, okay? There's many, many things about this about the emet, but I wanted to share one, I, I, it's a very long story, but I'll tell you one thing. The word emet, if you take the little first letter away, it's the Hebrew letter aleph, which has no sound. It's a numerical value of what has no sound. If you take the word emet and you take the little aleph away, it spells the word met. You know what met means? Met means dead. You take truth and you try to play with it a little bit, you're finished. You can't. And that's why the commandment in the Torah is not don't lie. 
it says, Midvar Sheker Tircha, run away from lies, run away from it. So, you know, like the world today, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think, and this is why it's so important for me to speak to, speak to people who were not born Jewish to understand because most people today do have a sense of there's one God, there's goodness in the world. Most people have this idea, but if they inherit concepts that they got from hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago when people were pagans and people had crazy ideas and they get stuck in that, then they're altering truth. And that's why it's so important. A person has to realize, no, there's not many gods, not three gods. There's one God who is all powerful and all benevolent. And, and when we realize that, we don't play with that. That's what happens. So today, people, people don't realize so many of the customs that came in, in different religions were pagan customs. The tree was a pagan custom. The caroling was the original in Saturnalia. They used to go around naked and they were drunk and they would go around from place to place and singing from house to house. It's, 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 it's very, I mean, it's hard to imagine it's not connected. So there were many customs that people took in, and today people people don't think that. They like, listen, it's, they just want to be good. They want to they want to they want to try their best, and that's really beautiful. I really I really commend that people want to be good people today. They don't have so many of the crazy ideas that the world had when the world was a polytheistic pagan place. But when you play around with truth and you start changing it, you start making up your own things, it leads us out into left field. We have to try to be a pure vessel, like a light, and say, let the light from above come shine in on us because we're not blending in things that are not true, things that what we believe and we want that we've gotten from some crazy other ideas and be pure to be able to shine that light into the world. Okay, that's my thought. And then open up to questions, ideas, and comments. Okay. Anybody I could keep talking about it, <laughs> but I think you got the idea. <laughs> Without being too uh, controversial to anyone or anything, but but. I mean, to say that, you know, to have this, you know, to understand, people don't realize the, the history, you know. The, I mean, we, people do know that, you know, that Rome became, you know, the seat of Christianity. First, Rome persecuted the Christians, and then afterwards, um, in, in, in time of uh, Constantine, they made it the religion of the state. But the, the ideas that come in and the, the changing of things, and that's why even like people don't realize when they hear many Christian ideas, so many of them have some basis in Jewish thought. They do, because it was reading the books and reading the ideas, but not knowing what they mean. And that's why it's a very, I want to tell you a fascinating, I think I shared this with you once, is a Midrash. The Midrash is the oral Torah, the oral Torah, which is is been written down originally was was not supposed to be written it was passed down by heart and the reason why is for many reasons but 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 it was supposed to be passed down orally and not put into writing for many many reasons i mean simply put when you if you know if somebody gets a you know becomes a doctor and a surgeon you don't want him to get it read by reading a book you know, he needs to have it from a teacher. He learned, he practiced. So the oral Torah is the explanation of the Torah. It was passed down orally in Judaism for many years till the year 2000 of the, 200 of the common era. So that means for over a thousand years it was passed down orally. And then what happened was the, the, the leading sage of, of the Jewish people, his name was Rabbi Yehuda Anasi. Um, he was actually friends with the Roman emperor, who we uh, attribute to be Marcus Aurelius, who was one of the actual Roman emperors who was a righteous person. He actually was a student of, Reb, of, of this rabbi in a hidden way. So he got some protection from the Roman persecution, and he wrote down the, the first body of the oral Torah called the Mishnah. 
So, so that was, that was now, was now first was committed to writing, which was not supposed to be, but it had to be because he saw the Jews were about to go into exile and Jews have been in exile for a long time. I mean, it's, it, I, I know for you, it's hard to me, for, for Jews, it's hard to imagine. Jews can't imagine like, wait a minute, during the time of King David and Solomon, that was the center of the world because Jews have been ex exiled, the Roman exile, we've been, the, it's called the Roman exile for 2,000 years. And we knew this was going to be the long exile. So in the long exile, the long exile of darkness. So the oral Torah has many teachings that are presented orally and then have been codified in, in shorthand in the Mishnah, in the Talmud, in the Midrash. There's a Midrash that says an amazing thing. It says in the future, the nations of the world will claim that they are the chosen people, the Jewish people. And this happened. You got to understand something. This didn't happen 2,000 years ago. No one was claiming that then. The Romans, the Romans laughed at the Jews. Why are you praying to a God you can't see? Right? People were barbarians. You got to realize that. The Romans said, you have one God? And you only have one? We got thousands. <laughs> so, so, you know, the world was like, like really pretty backwards. So it says that people will eventually start to claim that they are the new Jewish people, which is fascinating if you realize it, because every nation, what they're claiming is today, yes, the Jews were the chosen people. Yes, they agree with that. God gave the Torah, true. But then he changed it later. That's the way they want to deal with it, which, as I've told you many times, cannot be because the Torah says very, very clearly that it can never be changed. So whoever says it changed, it doesn't make sense. You can't say, I believe in the first book, and then he changed it because he says in the first book, he'll never change it. Okay, so many people have come now, and many people have said, we are the new, the new Jew, the new chosen people. But the reality is, as the Midrash says, the one thing they'll never have is the oral Torah that explains the Bible, the Torah, because Ladies and gentlemen, if you read the five books without the explanation, it's impossible to understand. And so people for, you know, for a couple thousand years now have been taking concepts that they find in the Torah and explaining it their way. And when they do, it has nothing to do with the source. It takes something and now we've altered it where it's unrecognizable. And that's what I'm saying, before, what my point is today. And it's very, very hard. It's very hard because, you know, y y we live in a world and we live in a world with family, friends, and, and, and you know, you, you, you want to be nice to everyone and, and, and you should be nice to everyone. At the same time, you have to realize that what's going on is that, is that people are not being critical of where do I know this from? Where did I get this? Where is this holiday's roots in? What is the belief? And once it starts to get altered, like the story of Adam, yeah, it was a powerful time. The darkest time of the year is a time where you got to be able to see the light in the darkness. That's true. But if you play around with it, you end up with something completely different. All right, that's an extrapolation of my point. And if anyone else has thought of any questions or an idea, <laughs> Yeah, yeah I'll, okay. I'll, ask, I'll ask something. Please. Uh, at the moment, <clears throat> what gets talked about the most is the uh, the eight days of the oil burning in the candle. But is that the, the main crux of this period? Because I thought it was the rededication of the temple. It was when the temple was rededicated. So am I right or wrong? Or it's yeah. a bit of both. No, you know, it's a great, it's a good, it's a good point. The, 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 in the story of Hanukkah, there are a few questions. One is that we barely mentioned the defeat of the mm -hmm. of Greeks, which is incredible because it's like if you'd have a, you know, a, I don't know, a band of, you know, twenty rabbis fighting, you know, the largest army in the world, and they would win. It's like, you know, so it's obviously, obviously a tremendous miracle, and we barely mention it. And the rededication of the temple is also seems to be somewhat sidelined by the story of the candle. But the reality is that it's all one and the same. And let me explain to you why. The, the, the battle of the Greeks was not 
necessarily, and this is what I, my point was today, it's not necessarily the physical battle. The Greeks were the first people that were the, the people, besides for the Jewish people, the people of the mind. And that's why even today, even today, the, 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 you know, the Greek, what is democracy? Is Democritus was he was the guy who discovered democracy. He was a Greek. It was his idea, and he said, "We're going to have you know people voting, you know." So these ideas they came into the world, and they looked very tantalizing. And the battle was the battle for the mind. The candle lighting represents wisdom. When I when I look at something and I say, you know, I, something makes sense to me, I say, "Oh yeah, I, I see that." Oh, it's clear to me. Yeah, I, I, I could see exactly what you're saying. What does that mean? It means that seeing is the most strongest proof in the world, right? Witnesses cannot testify in Jewish court based on anything other than they saw the act. Seeing is associated with understanding. And therefore, the light is what gives you the ability to see. And so oil... And the light from the oil represents wisdom. And the battle of the Jews and the Greeks was to, in, to inaugurate the temple again. Yes, it was. It was to beat them in a war. But the, the, the victory that happened then was for the Jewish people to come and say, okay, you guys have your wisdom. You're smart people. I'm not taking that away from you. But your wisdom is lacking because the wisdom that is based in the, in the light of the temple, the wisdom that comes from its source, that's a pure eternal wisdom. So the lighting of the candles does contain in it the idea of the rededication of the temple. The problem was, the danger, the battle was, how do you use the mind? The war was, the Greeks didn't want to kill the Jews. They didn't want to kill anyone. What they wanted was that everyone should adopt the Greek beliefs. And everybody did. Why wouldn't they? <laughs> it swept across the world. And everyone said, oh, this is pretty good. We're barbarians. And now we, we have some science. Now we have some logic. But the Jews said, no, no, this is not for us. So the lighting of the candles really is the, is the, the summation of the rededication of the temple in the new era. And that's why the mystics say an amazing thing. They say, that the Greek philosophers disappear after the story of Hanukkah. The great Greek philosophers, we don't hear anything after that. Before, we have Aristotle, we have Socrates, we have Plato, we have all that. But afterwards, why not? So the, the sages, the, the mystics say, because that power of using the mind, which was something that they were misusing, but they had something, was taken back and re-brought into a line of holiness to be brought for everyone to, to get from the temple, not from your idea in your head. The temple light went out to everyone. I said this to you guys many times. It, it, the temple did not just benefit the Jews. It benefited the whole world. In the time of King Solomon, there were no natural disasters, none. There were no famines any place in the world. And it says, if the nations of the world understood that, not only would they have not destroyed the temple, they would put guards to protect it 24-7 because it was the greatest thing for the world. But they didn't understand that. They didn't understand that. And that's the same thing here. This is not, this is not like, I, you know, I, I speak to you as a Jew and as a rabbi, I might, but this is not, this is, this is for everyone. This is, this is the good of the entire of humanity. Hashem loves all of his creations. And, and, and if the Jew has a job, we're all, you're all part of, of the mission that we have in the world, which is to bring God's light into the world. And that's why Hanukkah, although it's beating the war and it's rededication of the temple, it's the new level of the battle that could have destroyed the world and hurled it into darkness, which would look like light because they were so smart, but it was darkness. And that's why the lighting of the candle is, is the symbolic root of, of the whole victory of Hanukkah. I, I got a question for you. <clears throat> uh, New Year's Eve is coming up. I guess that has pagan, um, I guess, influence or um, 
origins, I guess, New Year's Eve, New Year's yeah. Day, by Christmas. It eight, the eight days or the days from the winter solstice, so seemingly. But but it's not, New Year's Eve, like Thanksgiving, it, it doesn't have much uh, um, uh, negative connotation. Therefore, a person who wants to, I don't know, you know, not celebrate as a religious thing, but he wants to go out, you know, with his friends or have a drink, you know, to start a new calendar year, it's not necessarily forbidden. Both New Year's and Thanksgiving, a person a person could do because they they don't they're not uh, strongly associated with it. They're they're, and the truth is, you know, even even you know, the twenty fifth of December in the world is very secular in so many ways. People don't really realize it, you know, and that's why it's, I'm talking about people like most people are like no, it's just about like, you know, hey, like let's we all want peace and love. We all we all do want that. And so, and so most people don't even recognize the roots of things. And, and I, like I said, but that's, but that's, that's where the danger comes into it. It's, it's, it's important to realize the roots of things and important to fine tune why we're doing things. What, what's this based on? But thank, but, but, but New Year's is, is, is easier because New Year's is not so connected with with the thing, even though it, it may have overlapped, but now it's just the, you're if, if you're going to do something on New Year's, you're doing it as as a uh, um, just the start of a new calendar year. So, yeah, so it's more of a secular thing than uh, make a it, religious it, thing. Yeah, make it make it totally secular in your minds. I mean, some people may have some connections, but like I say, these things have have gone over and translated. So, but that, but I would say that's the, that's that's what your goal is. You know, think about it that way. It's that's. And be okay. Good, good. Other questions, ideas, comments, thoughts? There is a question in the, in the chat section. Uh, Shukot Noah is asking when does the res resurrection of the dead happen in the timeline? So that, that's in the 7,000th year. That's not in the 6,000th. That's in the 7,000th. Um, and uh, that is after everything in history is done, meaning all, you know, the 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 judgment of a person, you know, there's judgment on, on Rosh Hashanah, there's judgment after a person dies, but there's another judgment after all of history ends. Why is that? It's like I died 200 years ago, so how could, why should be rejudged at the end? And that's and that's when the ultimate uh, the idea of resurrection is. So the reason for that is is that if you help somebody now, you do something good. You do not know the seeds that you've planted that you might be able to reap in the future. I I always tell a story. There's a guy I know. He's a he's an educator. He's a rabbi. And he's helped a lot of people. And he told me when he was a kid, he wasn't observant. He didn't grow up religious. And when he was a kid, one day he decided to go to synagogue. And he went. And he went once. And, you know, people were busy and nobody said anything. Twice, no one said anything. Third time he said to himself, listen, if somebody doesn't say hello to me and greet me, that's it, I'm out. Third time, a guy went over and says, oh, I've seen you come the past few weeks. Great to see you. Ah, what's your name? And that is what the person needed, this young kid. And years later, he became a rabbi. So all the thousands of people that he helps is going to go to the credit of the guy who said hello to him in the synagogue. He'll also get credit for himself, of course. But the guy who said hello to him he he's he doesn't even realize he's just gathering in the the, the interest on this. So so the, the, there's an ultimate day of judgment when the world is complete, the whole cycle is complete. After the times of Mashiach entering the seven thousandth year, in seven thousand seventh millennium, when exactly is a, a hard question to answer. But uh, um, but when the world is complete, and then there's going to be an ultimate uh, judgment of everything. Everything has to be back in its place. And then there's the idea of the of people coming back to life. What that looks like and what it means is a very, very, very deep and, and mystical topic. Um, but yes, that's that's true. 
Good. Any more questions in the chat? I didn't realize. I'm sorry. I didn't check. No, that was it. Yeah, that was it. Okay. Very good. Okay. How would one, um, how would someone handle, I guess, being a Noah Hyde who you have that Hellenistic mindset, maybe on half of the marriage, like one spouse, you're coming into the Noah Hyde um, where one spouse is still very much Hellenistic, you know, still in their Christianity. And then you have another spouse who's ex-Christian. Um, but that spouse has, who's ex-Christian, is Torah-based, has been raising their kids that way, wants them to continue on that path. But then you have that still Hellenistic struggle of the spouse wanting to kind of step in. Like, how do you handle that? Where it's not like it's an intermarried Jewish couple. It's not that, you know, right. black and white. Right. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, and, it, and it requires a lot of, good question, it requires a lot of wisdom here because the, the, the reality is, is that when, when when you want to be able to speak and, and and share with your spouse and and the things that you're going to say that make sense that are going to are going to are going to sit with the the spouse eventually they'll they'll be able to incorporate it but if you go in trying to preach and trying to change someone then then Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody, everyone can only hear what they can hear. That, that's the rule. And, and therefore, you got to know there's a principle. Just like it's a mitzvah, it's a proper thing to say things that can be heard. It's a mitzvah not to say something that can't be heard. There's a time where you say, all right, this is not, right now, we're not, you know, I, I don't agree with that. I, I think this and you think that okay let's put that on the side because we're not we don't we're not in agreement on that let's go deal with other things that are possible that a person could hear the other person's position so you have to navigate it in a way where there's discussion there's growth there's ability to hear and yet not overstep where you're saying this is not going to be heard right now I, I, I'm not. I'm not going there. You, you think that? I think there's disagree, and then and then if, if you if you fight the smaller battles, the things that a person can hear, eventually they're open to hear things that that they might not have been willing to hear years ago. And uh, I just had my 35th wedding anniversary, so it's like it's like kind of shocking. Like you know, certain things are like. You know, I kind of talked about these things, you know, you know, many years ago. And I said to my wife, hey, you know, like kind of now it's, it's we're, we're, we're on the same page. You know, <laughs> like, I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't push certain things years ago. And, you know, we're both, we're both, uh, you know, religious Jews, but I have, yeah, I have different opinions. But okay, it doesn't go in so, so much. You have to build something. Just to understand this principle a little bit better. You know, God does not expect you to go from zero to a hundred. That, that can't be done. Zero goes to one. One goes to two. Two goes to three. That's the way it has to be. You can't go from zero to a hundred. You're going to fall back. So wherever the person is, communicate the concept that is the next step that the mind can handle. And and I and and I, and I think I, and I I do believe I have I have uh, uh, you know some some faith in humanity. I mean, I have some some problem with people not thinking today, but but if you get people when you get their guards down and they're not you know repeating stuff and they're able to feel you, you care about them, you love them, then a lot of times people we do have minds that should be able to understand truth, and then you can get that through. Does that, does that make sense? That does, yeah. Thank you. Okay, my pleasure. Okay, I think I have another question here in the chat. Hold on. Um, are you talking about in, in terms of, uh, of, yeah, this is not a... Kyle, I think, is asking about a calculation about J.C.'s uh, uh, when he was alive. There's apparently 150 years that this is not a Jewish source necessarily. There's even Christian scholars. Oh, I'm sorry. What were you referring to? 
150 years off in terms of what? <laughs> I thought Kyle's question was different. They're, 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 uh, they're the Hebrew calendar. No, the Hebrew calendar is not 150 years. The, the, there was a 150 year discussion um, on, on by, by JC because there's Christian theologians that say he was a composite person because he actually, we know who he was. He was a student of Rabbi Shum Parachia. Who is it? Who is uh, the timeline doesn't fit to when people say he was, but there's a lot of contradictions. But in the Jewish calendar, there's not no, there's not a there's not 150 years off. Unaware of such a such a thing. If you find any source, show me that. But I I I've, I've never heard such a thing. We we have a pretty uh, you know it's amazing. I, I, you know it's 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 very fascinating. But you can you know if you look at the book called Ethics of Our Fathers. Yeah, I think it was a reference to and JC that there was 150 years missing. And, and, and what Charles asking was, apparently, and this is not a Jewish discussion as much, there are Christian scholars. I mean, obviously, they're not mainstream Christian, but they say that JC was a composite person because during the time of the Roman persecution, there were many people that came saying they were the Messiah and there was a, there was a, a discrepancy of 150 years. And some people say that there was a, there was a, uh, a um, it became a composite to fix the time. You go, I'm sure Tuvia Singer uh, has a lot of discussions about exactly that. I'm sure you can find there with Tuvia Singers always discusses these things. Um, but in, in as far as the, uh, um, the the Jewish calendar, you know, we, we you know it's quite accurate. And what's quite amazing, like, you know, the the in the in the Mishnah called the Ethics of Our Fathers, it lists the transmission of the Torah from Moshe, okay? And it goes down to the end of the second temple. Now we have people that can connect their lineage straight back to there, both their, their birth lineage, as well as their teachers. You know, I, like I, I have a friend who is a Kohen who can trace his lineage back to the second temple, you know, exactly. Now that's an amazing thing. That means that, that when I, and getting the Torah from my teacher, he can tr trace back getting it from his teacher, from his teacher, from his teacher, all the way back to me. That's incredible. That's that's a pretty, <laughs> it's, a, it's a very direct lie, you know? And that's why, by the way, one of the decrees of the Romans was they forbade what's called the smicha. The smicha was the ordination. The ordination we have today is not the classic ordination. The classic ordination was only allowed to be done in the land of Israel. And it was the ordination that Moses gave to Joshua. And it meant that you know everything. Like today, you can get ordination as a rabbi in certain areas, you know, in these laws or those laws. But there was a transmission that was given that the ordination happened in the land of Israel. And that was said that you knew everything and you were the next link in the chain. The Romans, uh, they made a decree that person couldn't, couldn't break, give ordination to their, to their student. And they said, if a rabbi did, he would be killed, the student would be killed, and the entire city would be destroyed. And there's a very famous story of one rabbi, Yehuda Buddha, who went out into the, the desert and he gave five rabbis ordination. He was in between cities, so it couldn't be blamed on any city. And he gave his five rabbis ordination, and then the Romans came, and he told the students to run. He was an old man, and he got, you know, they, they pierced him with arrows, and he died. But he was willing to sacrifice that to maintain the chain. So even though we don't have that fully in the sense that ordination stopped when we got exiled from the land of Israel, but we do have a direct line that goes back to, way back to Moshe, and then Moshe to Abraham. Then Abraham to Adam. So that's a pretty straight, straight shot. I, I can add to that last line that Kyle wrote, because uh, he says, and he had to say name, I think he's referring to the JC thing. Uh, I recall the Rabbi Singer saying, if the Christians tend to use a Yeshua that's I think it's in the Talmud. There's two mentions, but one each one is a hundred years out. One's a hundred years before JC's supposed time. The other one's a hundred years after JC's time. So I think that might be what 
inquiries about but yeah but that that uh, there's a hundred years i recall it's about a hundred years both of them a hundred years out one before and one after showing debunking christianity saying oh, look your shoe sure is in the in the talmud right well the truth is you know <laughs> he has mentioned the talmud um we even know the story it was censored by the early christians there's a there's a there's a story in in the Talmud which was censored. We have the version, but it was censored, which talks about when his rabbi or Yeshua and Parachia kicked out, kicked him out as a student. It's a very it's a very uh, sort of sad story there. But he he rejected him as a student, and then he came back and he tried to get the rabbi to forgive him, and then the rabbi. Uh, said no once and twice, and the third time the rabbi was going to accept him back as a student, and he, he was saying the Shema, he closed his eyes, and then when and when he didn't answer, so JC said, oh, he's rejected, I'll make up my own my own path. Um, you know, so we do have we do have stories that, you know, he, again, he was never a rabbi, he was a student of a rabbi, uh, he never was a smich rabbi, um, <laughs> I don't know what the question was. He was, he was a student of the rabbis, a, a rabbi, and, and that's that's what it was. So, yeah, we do have him recorded. It's not, uh, you know, we do say he was an actual person and a Jewish person. Told, I, I'm not sure what this question means. It told us, I, I, I don't know what that refers to, told us. I mean, Yeshu is what the rabbis, the nickname they gave to him as uh, his name was you know, Yeshua. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. We, we, again, like, you know, it's like, we know who he was. He was a student of the rabbi. He, something happened and Talmud records what happened and his rabbi got angry at him and kicked him out. And he made up his own ideas. And uh, and then it's kind of like how we started the session today. You can't, you can't go, you know, you can't go and, uh, um, and uh, you know, and make up your own things. You just can't do it. You know, even if you, it's like I, I you know, I, 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 I don't know if I should say this, but but it's like I spoke a few weeks ago about something that upsets me very much, and it it's what it is is that you know the, there are. The Jewish people have a mission in the world. Noahides have a mission in the world. The Jewish people have to be a light unto the world and to teach. That's why we're here trying to teach and trying to learn, trying to grow together. But the reality is, is the Jew has that quality and takes it and does not use the Torah. He makes up crazy things. He makes up crazy ideas. And yes, there are secular Jews who have taken their qualities and brought great things to the world. I mean, 22 to 26% of Nobel Prize winners are Jewish out of a 0.001% of the world. It's crazy. So there's a quality and good things they brought to the world also. But, but there are philosophies that they brought in that were of people who are Jewish who did not know Judaism and made their own ideas. And they were wrong. Whether it was Karl Marx, whether it was Sam Bank Freed or whoever, whoever, whoever it was, you can't make these guys into messiahs. <laughs> you can't take these guys who, 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 who have a power and they're misusing it and they're saying things that they made up out of their own heads because it's not going to be right. It's not going to be right. And so it's really crucial to, 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 to connect to a, a to, to the Jews that are saying the real things because I don't care how popular any guy is at the time. If Karl Marx was popular at the time, these guys are popular at the time, it's not going to go because it's not truth. And so those are not the places to hang our hats. The place to hang our hats is is not an in, in individual. It's not, I, look, I tell you, it's not me. I'm not going to do with me. I'm trying to be a conduit to share Torah with you. That, that's it. You know, and if you show me a guy who is supposed to be a rabbi and does the wrong thing, he's doing the wrong thing. He, he's not, he doesn't define the religion. He's, everyone has to be the one who's saying, I want to be a conduit to share the Torah. And, and if he does one thing off, 
then, then he's gone. That was even happened to the King Solomon, who's the greatest of the great. He changed the rule a little bit because he thought he was going to save the world. And God said, no, 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 you can't do that. And that's why he fell. Yeah, someone just put in the in, in, in the you know in the comments here the second wave of, of feminism, you know there's there's so many of these things and and again I I don't I don't want to I'm not trying to you know I I I I will point out you know the and some people do point the incredible incredible gifts that the Jewish people gave the world and these things you know who are secular also you know for from Einstein to the to, to people who discovered all these different things great wonderful. I don't consider those the, the the leaders to me at all. Those are not those are those are not the leaders at all. Those are our people, you know, and everything. But but the philosophies of 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 a, a Jew that's not based in Torah stay away. Stay away because it's it's it doesn't end right. And the philosophy of anyone that doesn't based in Torah, it's just that you know this could be a, a, the jewish person has a power to bring a light into the world and he takes it and he twists it in any way it's going to come out not right and you might and 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 person might think oh this is this is the new savior of the time saying something but if it's not based in what god said not based in the torah it's not true it won't it won't it won't ever happen and mr metz we said it earlier exactly it's exactly what it is and it's true for everyone so guys Let's take the good side. I want to leave you with one positive note to understand this. Every nation in the world has its unique quality that has to be brought into the system. Every nation, you know, there were 70 Jews that went down to Egypt and there were 70 nations. And that's not an accident. And every nation has a quality and that has to be brought into the holy system. Whatever your country, whatever your nation, whatever your root is, there's something good that you have to bring into the system. And, and you got to look for that. You got to understand that. And you got to purify that. And don't let people dissuade you. Come and bring the goodness that you have that's part of your unique quality and bring that into the system to be able to reveal the light into the world. Okay. Take care, everybody. I will see you in two weeks. I'll try to send some thoughts out next week if you want to see a pre-recorded. But in two weeks, we'll be back together again and speak then. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.